I have mentioned encryption a lot so far. I've talked about how to encrypt your passwords with a password manager, how your passwords get hashed when you sign up for a website, which is a type of encryption. I've even talked about encrypting your web traffic with the Tor browser. But what is encryption and how does it work? This is a complicated subject, but it's one that's worth knowing, especially as we move forward into more topics that cover encrypted services. In this video, I hope to break down encryption into simple terms to help you understand everything you need to know about it. Before we begin, I would like to remind you that the new oil is supported by donations. If you get value out of this video, please consider donating to help keep us going. Recurring donations are the most helpful, but of course, even one-time donations help and any amount helps. We also have a ProtonMail affiliate link. I will be talking about ProtonMail a lot in this video, but there are other encrypted email providers like CTemplar and Tutanota. That is something I will talk about in another video. If you watch this video and think, holy crap, I need to get an encrypted email provider, ProtonMail is one that is worth looking into, and I will leave a link in the description that if you sign up for a paid account, I will get a small commission from that. This is entirely optional. You can sign up for a free account. You don't even have to use the affiliate link or even ProtonMail itself. This is just something that's out there that can benefit both of us if that's the route you decide to go. I will also include my referral code for C Templar, which is another encrypted email provider. If you sign up with them using that referral code, I will get one free month of Prime. Again, you don't have to use this. You don't even have to use C Templar. These are just options I'm including because they happen to be relevant to this video. When you were young, did you ever make up your own secret language? I actually did this a lot. My friends and I would make up our own code to pass to each other to pass notes during class. And it was usually really simple, like A equals one, B equals two, stuff like that. So using this system, that means if I wrote the word hello instead of H-E-L-L-O, it would become eight, five, 12, 12, 15. This is encryption, believe it or not. Albeit it's a very terrible and weak encryption. It keeps anyone who doesn't understand our code from reading the message. As I said, this is really weak and it doesn't take very long for anyone at all, even amateurs, to crack this kind of a code. If we're gonna talk about real life day-to-day -day encryption where we are going up against very skilled attackers and cryptographers, and for some people, even state level actors, we're gonna need something a little bit stronger. Before we jump into that, let me talk about the second part of encryption, which is the decryption key. Let's use the grade school encryption example again. In the A equals one, B equals two, the key is just that A equals one. But let's say we wanna make it a little more secure. Let's say that A starts at five. So A equals five, B equals six, C equals seven, D equals eight, and so on. In this case, our example of hello now becomes 12, nine, 16, 16, 19. In this example, our key is five, and this is actually what's known as a Caesar cipher. Basically, all we've done is moved the letters a certain amount. Without knowing that the key is five, it becomes harder to decrypt. We could even further obfuscate the key by using a word instead of a number. For example, the word Apple is five letters. Real world encryption algorithms, the kind that we actually use in privacy and security, are needless to say, a lot more complicated than this, but the basic principle is the same. Encryption is using mathematical algorithms to make data incomprehensible unless the person attempting to read it has the decryption key. Now, of course, that's in a perfect world because not all encryptions are equal. For example, there used to be an encryption algorithm called DES or Data Encryption Standard, and that used to be the bar. But as researchers looked into it more, they found weaknesses and they found vulnerabilities that can make it unsecure. So it is no longer safe to use. This is just how technology goes. Somebody comes out with something and at the time it works, but over time, new things replace it that are better and stronger. In this case, DES was replaced with AES, which is Advanced Encryption Standard. At the time of this recording, AES has no known weaknesses and is safe to use. Pro tip though, on that note, this stuff, like I said, is constantly evolving. AES is secure right now, but we don't know what the future holds. In 10 or 20 years, there might be some new vulnerability that gets discovered. I highly recommend you stay informed. Whether that means subscribing to this channel, I also run a weekly current events podcast with TechLore called Surveillance Report. I have a Mastodon and a Twitter feed. I have a blog. Pretty much just find a good source to stay updated with this stuff because it does change. Something that is secure and private today may change and not be secure and private tomorrow. And it's important that you're aware of that when it happens so that you know to stop using it. Back to encryption. There are two kinds of encryption. There is symmetric and asymmetric. Symmetric encryption put simply means that there is only one key. This is the kind of encryption you might use when you don't need to share information with anyone else. For example, logging into your computer or a secure cloud storage. The data is not being sent to anyone else 
to be accessed, so there's no need for a second key for that person. With asymmetric encryption, there are two or more keys. This is the kind that you would use for secure communication, like PGP, for example, which, by the way, I'm gonna make a whole video about that in the future, so just hold on to your thoughts. All you need to know right now is, again, asymmetric encryption involves multiple keys and is used for communication with other people. Symmetric encryption involves one key and is used for storing things. Now we know that encryption uses math to make data unreadable except for people who have the decryption key, and there are two kinds of encryption. Let's see what this looks like in a real world scenario. Let's say you go to mega.io, which is an encrypted cloud storage provider that I'm using for this example. When you sign up with your password, that password becomes your key. Entering that password decrypts the files in your storage drive. This is an example of symmetric encryption. There is only one key and that is yours. When it comes to asymmetric encryption for the end user, the process is gonna look very similar most of the time. If you're using a platform like Matrix or C Templar, you sign up, you enter a password, and that password acts as your private key. In both of these cases, the platforms are simply handling the key management on your behalf. Now, it's important to note, if the platform is designed right, that company will never actually see your keys and cannot decrypt your information. They can see a hash of your key, which is like a one-way encryption that they can't decrypt. I talked all about that in my password video, so check that out if you need a little more information on how hashes work. Things get a little bit complex here, so again, I'm not really gonna dig into this. Maybe a little bit in the PGP video, but the takeaway is if these places are doing it right, they cannot see your key and therefore they cannot decrypt your data. Now this brings us to a very specific type of encryption called end-to-end -end encryption, which is abbreviated as E2EE -E, and is sometimes also called zero knowledge, zero access, or even warrant proof encryption. Personally, that last one is a little bit of a red flag for me, along with the phrase military grade encryption. These are usually just marketing buzzwords designed to make uneducated users feel like they're getting something special when they're not. By the way, after watching this video, you are no longer an uneducated user. It's not a dead giveaway that the company is not providing what they claim, it's just sensationalist. So anyways, what is end-to-end -end encryption? Basically, it means that nobody can decrypt the content except you and the intended recipient. You see, over 90% of the internet is encrypted these days according to expert estimates. But that encryption has a lot of points where the encryption can be broken and decrypted, and that's by design. Let's take Gmail, for example. Your traffic between your computer and Google servers is encrypted using TLS, which is a very powerful and very common type of encryption. You may recognize it as HTTPS in your browser with a little green lock and all that. Again, this is a very powerful encryption. The problem is that once your traffic arrives on Google servers, Google owns your decryption keys, but they're not just managing your keys in a secure way. They have your keys. They can decrypt your content. They used to do this. Up until recently, Google would decrypt your emails and scan them for keywords to add to your marketing profile. They say that they have stopped, and honestly, I believe them, but we have no real way of knowing if that's true, so maybe they didn't. Real end-to-end -end encrypted platforms like Tutanota and Session, for example, they don't have access to your keys, so they can't decrypt your data. Even with a warrant, companies like Google and Apple, if they are served a lawful order, they can decrypt that data and then turn it over to law enforcement. They can give your whole inbox over to somebody. That's why this is often called warrant-proof encryption, because a warrant doesn't work. Even if they're served with a lawful order, they physically cannot decrypt the data. It's impossible. For most listeners, warrants are not really a problem, but data breaches are, and the principle is the same. If the attacker gets into Google's network, for example, they can access your email content. But if an attacker gets into Tutanota or ProtonMail, they can't access your content. It's encrypted even from them, which is also why it's called zero access. We'll talk about all this in another video. The point being, zero knowledge is important. Now, I do wanna give a warning about end-to-end -end encryption. You need to match services to get the full effect. Personally, I do not mind services that manage the keys for you, like Signal and ProtonMail, because they make using encryption very, very easy for the average non-tech savvy person. One drawback of these services, though, is that in order to get the benefit, the person you're talking to also has to be using the same service. With ProtonMail, as an example, you can sign up for ProtonMail and you can email anyone. You've probably already seen this before. You can email anyone with a Gmail account or a Yahoo account or a Tutanota account. However, as soon as the email leaves Proton servers, it becomes decrypted. Two things happen here in these examples. If I'm emailing someone on Tutanota, for example, the email is only exposed while it's in transit. Once it hits Tutanota servers, it gets re-encrypted. The Tutanota side is now encrypted and my side on Proton is now encrypted. And in both of those cases, an attacker cannot come in and access the inbox. But while it is decrypted in between services, a lot of, for example, automated surveillance that organizations like the NSA and the CIA perform can snatch that email up and make a copy of it. 
In the case of emailing Gmail or Yahoo, the situation is even worse because again, the copy of the email that's on my inbox in Proton in the sent box is safe and encrypted. But once it leaves Proton servers, it gets decrypted, it gets sent to Gmail and Yahoo who do have copies of the decryption keys and they can access that inbox anytime they want. It's perpetually exposed at that point. So I am getting the benefit of encrypting one side of the conversation, but unless we're both using the same service, whether that's Proton, C Templar, or Tutanota, then at some point, the email is exposed. In order to get the full benefit, we both have to be using the same provider. This also goes for messengers like Signal, XMPP, iMessage, and any other real-time messaging service that allows you to communicate with people who are not using that same provider. If I'm using an iPhone and I'm sending a regular SMS text message to an Android user, we're not gonna get the end-to-end -end encryption that iMessage offers. It'll just be a regular unencrypted SMS message. There's still a bunch of caveats to this too. For example, email is an inherently insecure medium. I would never send anything critically important over email, and I will talk about why in a different video that is all about email. There are also ways to import PGP keys with certain services, like C Templar and ProtonMail, for example, allow you to import keys and manage your own keys to securely talk to people who are using different providers. I will go over all of that in another video, so hold on to those thoughts. I just want you guys to be aware. Don't sign up for ProtonMail and then email people on Gmail and think, oh man, I'm secure now. No, you both have to be using the same service to get the full benefit. Encryption is, in my opinion, probably the most pivotal concept in privacy and security, or at least in the top two, because it protects your data. You can encrypt just about everything. You can encrypt your phones and computers. That way, if they get lost or stolen, whoever finds it can't access your data, like phones and messages and banking apps. That's symmetric encryption, by the way, the ability to encrypt your devices. You can use encrypted messengers so that your messages don't get caught up in data breaches or accessed by rogue employees. And again, with things like TLS, encryption is already being used to protect your login information and your credit card details when you buy online. Encryption is everywhere. It's all around us. This video is a very, 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 very high level overview of encryption. It is not designed to be comprehensive. It is not designed to turn you into an expert cryptographer. Think of this video like learning English or algebra in grade school. It's not designed to make you a professional writer or an engineer. It's designed to give you a functional level of understanding so you can navigate the world properly. This video has the same aim. My goal is to explain what encryption is, how it works, and why it matters. Because in coming videos, we're going to be talking about a lot of encrypted services and encrypted concepts. Once again, if you find this video helpful, please keep the new oil going and help me produce more content to help make the world a more private and secure place. We accept donations, we accept one-time or recurring, there's fiat currencies, there's cryptocurrencies, and again, there's an affiliate link for ProtonMail. If you decide that you want to use an encrypted email provider, you can sign up for a paid service, I get a small commission, or you can sign up for C Templar, use the referral code. I don't see anything about you, I just get a free month of Prime, or you can use standard links, you can use different services, that's entirely up to you. In the meantime, you can learn more about encryption and some of the various encrypted services I recommend by checking out thenewoil.org.